All right, you know what's the worst thing for a speaker? There's two things that are really bad for a speaker. One is a near empty room, and one is a room with people standing in the back because the expectation is so high. And you have to tell you, some of you who are standing right now are going to leave. It's like, oh, I'm getting tired. This guy is speaking like, what the hell? <laughs> and then we kind of, you know, just go, you know, the talk. So stakes are high, but I have the cutest email in the world. Look at that. All right, so uh, I'm very honored to uh, be at the first edition of, of CBBCon, which uh, looks absolutely awesome. What, hands up if you liked the conference so far. All right, there's always time to disappoint. <laughs> so I'll ask after this talk and let's see. So I'll get right into it. I have some tips regarding, uh, regarding optimization for all of us, things that surprised me quite a bit. I talked about uh, optimization in the past, and I derived uh, quite a few uh, insights from my work on HHVM at Facebook. HHVM is our JIT compiler for PHP and Hack, and um, it's a high-profile product at Facebook. We open sourced it recently. Uh, it's a high-profile product in the sense that every 1% that it does better it's going to save the company a lot of money in terms of power and in terms of uh, um, acquisition of hardware. So only power costs can be uh, a high figure. Uh, to that end, uh, there's going to always be uh, people who do care about that extra uh, umph that they get from hardware. It's like you know, the B-list actors versus the A-list actors. There are actors in the B-list that are pretty good they're not just there, and everybody wants to see the A-list actors. Same here, you know, we could uh, have used second-rate um, uh, techniques, uh, and we got so far so sophisticated uh, things like linker scripts and the other, uh, you know, the other tricks imaginable, including some you're going to see today. So inlining, inlining is one odd optimization because it essentially enables and um, uh, enables and interacts with all others. Uh, all optimizations interact with one another, but inlining is sort of the first step in, uh, in a, a long list of optimizations. Once you inline code, then a lot of things start to happen. A lot of code gets exposed, white box, and then other optimizations start kicking in. So it's um, not surprising that once you do one stage of inlining, what's gonna happen next is many other optimizations are gonna kick in and the code at the end of the whole process is going to look like nothing like the inline function. Uh, who's kind of familiar with this kind of stuff? Did you ever disassemble code and stuff? I'm in the right place. Fantastic. All right, the last hand, Nevin. Perfect. So <clears throat> it's very hard to estimate, and it's very hard for a compiler writer to say, here's my cost function for a line. Here's the cost function that makes me decide whether or not I'm going to inline a function and subsequently inline transitively other functions inside of it, right? And uh, there's kind of an interesting uh, thing that when you benchmark uh, compiler speed, you often benchmark on a micro benchmark, a small benchmark on a small application or media application at most. And you know, the, the estimates that you get from benchmarking uh, the performance of your liner are going to be quite different from what you see in a, finite, uh, in a, a finalized application. So far so good? All right. Here's a tip. This is, not, I mean, this is not an essential tip, but it's kind of a small tip. Um, so micro tip. Uh, we, uh, we took a long time at Facebook to migrate from GCC 4.7 to GCC 4.8. Because GCC 4.8 had like a horrible like 5% regression in performance. And 5% is like just, you know, it's in the millions. It's just a huge regression for us. And until... Um, we kind of you know, got to discuss about it, and I was like, oh, actually, there's uh, quite a few things that control the inlining in GCC. And once you pass these parameters to GCC 4.8, you get a win instead of a loss. You get, we get a 2% win. So it's, this was 7% 7 difference on a large application. Just to show you how sensitive the inliner is to, uh, to a, a variety of uh, parameterization and the tweaking. And tweaks do matter. You know, I've, I mentioned this in the past. Tweaks do matter, so it's, many people think, oh, uh, I get it to the proof of concept stage and then tweaking is gonna give me like 10% more or 50% more. 
Actually, tweaking can get to 50x more, right? Can get to a lot, so tweaking does matter. All right, so uh, let's uh, sort of getting into it, and this is gonna uh, kind of uh, uh, put the aligning on the spot. There's some dark matter going on in uh, every C++ program, uh, which is constructors and destructors. So, first of all, you know, one bad thing about constructors and destructors is that everybody says they're good, right? That was a joke. <laughs> I was kidding here. You know, contrast, it's a humor technique. Seinfeld, I don't know. Um, so everybody says they're good. Mother and apple pie, so you should uh, define constructor and destructor. You rely on constructor and destructor. Uh, R A double I, all that good stuff. So they are kind of uh, good in a way that uh, the program technique is good for, for a variety of uh, um, sort of um, quality uh, reasons. However, it turns out quite surprisingly, at least to me, it was that constructors and destructors are a major enemy when they ally with inlining for your code size, right? So the way it goes is, well, you have you write constructors and it's destructors, and often they're going to be implicitly generated without you even kind of, you gotta think a bit about it. Because you have a, for example, you have a struct, and it's, oh, it's a struct, it's, you know, I didn't write any constructor, but at some point you change a char star to a string, and all of a sudden a member of the struct has a constructor and, and the destructor, and all of a sudden the struct itself be, um, uh, is bestowed with a constructor and destructor. Am, am I making sense? Right? Okay. So uh, all of a sudden we have this transitive effect. Like you know, you have one. Uh, you know, we have one uh, drop of. It's like homeopathy, right? You have uh, one drop of uh, good stuff in a well of water, and the, the more water there is, the worse it gets. I mean, the better it gets. You know, there's this joke about you put a drop of like uh, dirt and the homeopathic effect would be disastrous because if you reach the ocean, that drop is gonna be a disaster, right? <laughs> it's the reverse of homeopathy. So anyhow, it's the same with uh, members, right? Pretty much the same. The way it goes is once you have a member that has a constructing instructor, a bunch of stuff is gonna generate from it and transitively to, to, the, um, uh, to the structures that contain it. So it, it, it gets worse from here because uh, very often these are automatic generators, so the compiler has complete control over, it, it's completely white box. The compiler is, is gonna be able to inline those guys. And it's like, oh, so I have this guy. So what's, you know, what's a few stores between friends there? You know, with a Russian accent, you know, that would be perfect, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, just a few stores there. You know, we're gonna store a few things and whatever it costs. So, but then it gets bigger, and it kind of, it's kind of a boiling frog kind of effect. And you get to the point where, hmm, so all of these implicitly generated um, constructing these destructors that are trivial, and what happens then is you have your code, the code that you're looking at contains dark matter in the interstices, right? Contains a bunch of stuff that you didn't write. You kind of have to think that it even exists and it's kind of present everywhere. And it gets worse because it's in line. So there's a lot of fat, you know, that bad, like brown fat or whatever the bad fat is, right? You have all that stuff in between the interstices of your code, in between the lines. There's code going on and there's code and code. And, code. and that has really bad effects at scale. I'll, I'll kind of get a bit into detail on that. But that goes beyond traditional advice because the traditional advice is, well, don't over copy objects. So you don't want to copy too many objects. You don't want to kind of overdo it. You want to avoid, you want to use our value references. You want to pass by reference, all that good stuff. But it's not only that. It gets worse because, for example, nobody advises you to not write destructors. Well, you gotta write it because it's there, right? However, these destructors, once present and once in line, they increase your code size sometimes considerably. So uh, I promise I'll get into detail about why that is bad. Why is it bad to have bad code? Uh, it turns out that the, the major liability at HHVM and I suspect that many other major projects is iCache spills. iCache is the instruction cache. 
And the way die cache works is like just like any cache, you, you load the instructions into it, except it's read only. So it's a, it's a way there's less pressure on it than a traditional data cache. So you load the instructions into, uh, into die cache, you execute them, and um, uh, every once in a while that you're gonna have to jump elsewhere and load some other stuff into the cache, and you're gonna have to evict the, evict the cache, all that good stuff, right, cache. And in micro benchmark, you're not gonna see iCache because micro benchmarks are not gonna be like, oh, let me write the one million lines of benchmark, right? Nobody's gonna do that, right? So micro benchmarks are no, not going to exercise many iCache effects. They're gonna you know, look at like the you know, itsy bitsy stuff and all that good stuff. And um, you know, now, now here's the thing, you're a compiler writer. What you're gonna do, are you optimize for those two customers who have big programs? How much money can they give you? I optimize for the, you, know, you optimize, you want to have good bench, benchmarks to look good in articles, right? You aren't jumped in, no, I'm, I'm serious actually, that was not a joke. <laughs> and this wasn't, what? Okay, so this is like negative day for me. Um, so, you know, you want to look good, you want to, uh, you know, you want to outdo the com competition, and you want to satisfy many of your customers, right? Nobody's gonna say, well, I'm gonna write a compiler that, that's gonna work great for Google and Facebook only, and the hell with the rest. They don't matter, right? I mean, nobody's gonna do that. So therefore, sorry? Google might. Google might. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. All right, so it's, it's kind of difficult to say, you know, what, what am I measured, uh, measuring this compiler against? Um, I have to add uh, some sort of a recent, uh, uh, the phantom bullet here. You know, we open source HHVM, and a lot of uh, good software is open sourced. So I think there's a good trend because it means compiler writers are going to be able to say, well, you know, GCC, the newer GCC can actually test against HHVM and other large programs and say, am I doing well on a large program like that that's realistic and does something interesting? So, um, you know, I hope that's, uh, that's going to be more of a trend. So, tip number one goes simply like this. Beware inline destructors. Beware, it doesn't mean don't, don't do them. I'm not saying you to not do them. I'm saying to be aware of what's costing you. So, inline destructors are, so destructors are going to be called everywhere implicitly. Um, as an aside, they, they add significant code to functions that may throw because you need to have like the, the whole cleanup code. Um, that's why it's nice to um, you know, adorn your functions with no except whenever possible, right? And they're not reflecting the source code, uh, in the source code size, and that's a transitive effect, so it, it's, it gets pretty thick pretty soon. And they're often generated by the compiler, which means the compiler is going to be eager to inline them. Compilers are very eager to inline uh, quite a bit, so therefore, watch the structure uh, size carefully. And here's, here's a simple thing you can do. Uh, I don't have a slide for that, but this is a very simple thing. So, you know, people say, uh, oh, I'm not gonna write the destructor because it's actually a tip, I think, in uh, Herb's and my book. I mean, probably we should recant on that. But it's like, you know, you don't need to, if you need to write your destructor, maybe you've done something wrong elsewhere because you're too low level. Uh, ideally, you'd have your members, such as unique pointer and shared pointer and whatnot, vector, whatnot take care of the destructor for you and it's generated and it's called and everybody's happy. Actually, everybody's not happy. Sometimes it's nice to just declare the destructor in, the, in, the, in your class, semicolon, right? And then define it in the CPP file such that the compiler does not have easy access to get its grubby little hands on it <laughs> and inline it. And you, you define in the, we say equal default and you're, or you just put the empty braces and you're good. Right? It's just that you're explicitly saying, you know what? I know you could, defi I know you could define this for me, but I'm going to uh, you know, def define it nevertheless. And you go ahead and define it in the C++ file. And then, of course, um, the story goes. It never ends. Uh, link time inlining. You know, it's like we try to punch them here, and they punch us. You know, it's just, it never ends. <laughs> There's no guard, OK? So then the guys come with, uh, with link time inlining and say, ah, there it is. <laughs> and it looks like an empty body. So, hmm, what's a few stores between friends, right? <laughs> All right, so 
watch the structure the size carefully. And you know, you may want to just disassemble sometimes your destructor and see, you know, how big this is this guy and how much does it affect me, right? So beware in line destructors. And just to give you a taste, I'm not sure, is this readable at all? No, okay, unanimous. Okay, let me see. I think I can read it. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, this, is a, this is a program we use that essentially there's a team dedicated. It's a big deal. Uh, it's a program that we use for, uh, for assessing performance of our, uh, of our JIT compiler. And um, essentially, if you inline one destructor, uh, the top line is what matters. And it says this. It says CP instructions minus 0.3%. CPU time plus 0.4%, which means if I line one destructor in a structure in my large program, one destructor, literally, of one type. It's a widely used type, nevertheless, but you know, I'm cherry picking here, but it's one destructor. And the bottom line effect has been the number of instructions I retire has reduced. Why? There's no more function called sequence, call and return, they're gone. So as a rule, whenever I inline anything, the, num the total number of instructions is going to go down, right? It's gonna go down because there's no more call and return. There's less code, there's fewer instructions to retire. There are more instructions present, but there are fewer instructions to retire, right? Great, so the trace is gonna be smaller, and that's uh, sustained by this, uh, by this uh, uh, test here. So I have minus 0.3%. So I gotta say, like on, on uh, you know, the HVNT, you see minus 0.3%, you say, this is not good. We're not gonna take that. It's, it's a loss, it's a regression. We, it's already a regression. Uh, up to like 0.2%, you can say it may be in the noise. So let me repeat the experiment. 0.3 and above is like already no, okay? So, but that's not what matters. You know, it's nice to have fewer instructions because fewer instructions are a good proxy for faster code. You'd think, right? However, somewhat paradoxically at first sight, CPU time has increased by 0.4%, which is definitely in the range of, um, you know, this is bad, this is a regression. So 0.4% is like, oh, so we're losing a few, you know, uh, quite a bit of money. I can't say the numbers, so you know, I hate that. So we're losing quite a, few, uh, quite a few dollars on just power costs alone and ventilation and all that good stuff. So no, that's a bad thing. So why did the CPU time increase, although the CPU instructions decreased? iCache. That's a nice Apple product in the making, <laughs> iCache. All right. So indeed, although the number of instructions retired has been reduced measurably, considerably, in fact, the total execution time has increased because of the, the, the um, uh, memory subsystem spends all that time uh, evicting and loading the instruction cache. So not good, and it's interesting that again, it's, it, it's a line of code that I changed in a destructor to actually change all of this stuff. And it's not the semantics I changed, it's just the inlining. Um, as a simple tip, here's how you control inlining on uh, the two, uh, actually three, because GCC and LVM do, uh, in, uh, uh, and sorry, and Clang do it the same. So GCC and Clang, you say, uh, always in line. <laughs> okay, so there's about like four keywords in GCC that control in lining, which kind of um, underlines the importance of the concept, right? I guess uh, it's also probably bad design on a few artifacts, but essentially you gotta write inline attribute always in line, just to make sure that it's always in line. And to tell you the truth, it's not always in line. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So it's not, even though you say always in line, it's not always going to be in line. Um, and with, uh, and uh, continuing with GCC, you say never in line, you say attribute no in line, and of course sometimes it's going to be in line. I'm not kidding. So these uh, things are, even though you say always and never, they mean almost always and almost never, but those are too long to type, so we said whatever. In VC++, uh, you do uh, force in line or decal spec of no in line, and that's the way the cookie crumbles. All right, now here's what I, do. here's what I did. I took HHVM and um, I defined never in line to be nothing. 
you know, they call it defanging. It, you take the fangs off, right? So they can't, kind of, you know, they can't do nothing, right? So I, I uh, defined uh, never in line to be nothing. Uh, well, the effect has been red, which means bad. Uh, so I got an increase by 0.9% in instruction count. Why was that? Huh? Function call overhead. And I also got a CPU time increase of 1.6%, right? So that's like a huge regression. And you know, mind you, I should add that never in line are hints introduced by engineers. So it's manual work. So this manual work has paid off this much. It's easy to measure. You can say, well, those people who spent hours doing that are, have gained 1.6% in CPU time. And now let's uh, do the other. Uh, let's defang always in line. So let's make always in line do nothing. And uh, with that, we're going to get indeed a reduction of uh, CPU instructions by 0.2%, but we're going to uh, go get an increase of CPU time of 0.8%. Uh, so both actually make things worse if you ignore them. So sometimes it's better to inline stuff, sometimes it's better to not inline. And it's, uh, it's essentially at this point, it's a hard enough problem that you need to um, take control in your hands and measure and assess how you address it. All right. Um, and now I'm going to, um, uh, to discuss all of this construction and destruction in lining issue. I'm going to uh, run a simple case study, which is like a sort of a user-defined shared pointer. You know, it's, uh, shared points have been such a popular topic for C++. Everybody has um, written a couple, you know, we, there's good understanding of what's going on. So it's sort of a simple example. But keep in mind that the effects uh, at work are more general than that. So shared pointer is the, you know, the obvious solution to reference counting. And it's uh, shared pointer in particular, the standard one. It's optimized for a blend of needs. So well, I want, uh, you know, uh, I want to actually share a, a, a pointer among threads without uh, aggravation, right? So therefore, you need to do atomic reference counting. Uh, you, I want to support custom deleters, and I want to support weak pointers so I can break cycles. Right? And there's no support for intrusive reference counting. And that's kind of a bad thing, because you know, if, if you're serious about it, you want to have intrusive reference counting. Um, it's, it's sort of a, a good thing for large applications. Now, I have, uh, uh, in, a past, um, in a past talk, I, I gave this tip which is the first cache line is where it's at. What do I mean by that? You have one cache, the fastest thing you get to. Right, so you have, a, you have a data structure, like a class or a struct, right? And you want to sort, you want to sort the members of that data structure by hotness, meaning you put the most attractive first. <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> OK. You put the, mo the hottest first, right? So you want to put the, the most access the most often first. And there's often cases in which you just swap a couple of members, and you, you have like a huge increase. Because once you, so you have the, uh, the address of the object, and essentially the first cache line, which is how many bytes? In chorus. 64. Thank you very much. Next time you sing it, OK? Just trill a bit. OK, so 64 bytes, the first 64 bytes of an object is where things happen, where the action goes. And there's a lot of people like, uh, the first member is a bool, like messes up the alignment completely. Like, you know, it's a Boolean that takes a word, actually, because of the alignment. And it's like, oh, was initialized. Or something that is test once. You know, it's tested once and not, does nothing for the rest of the lifetime. So you want to put the most accessed stuff in your objects at the front of the object. Front load the, uh, the hardness, right? So, Guess what? The reference counter is very hot. And often in a shared pointer, if you don't use make shared, it's going to be elsewhere, meaning a completely different cache line, completely different everything, right? Ideally, you would put the reference count right at the front of your object as the first member. So if you can afford the intrusive reference counting, that's where you want to be. Make sense? All right. Awesome. So 
Atomics do matter. So I've just been in this great talk about uh, log-free program, and I was very, I felt vindicated because there's all these people who say, oh, you know, atomics, atomic reference, uh, uh, you know, plus plus and minus minus. They're pretty much as good as the, you know, everything else, and they're not. I mean, it's like this. No matter how I measured, I got, I couldn't get any, you know, any faster than 2.5 times, right? And. Uh, uh, the talk before uh, was like 10 times. I was very happy. Like, okay, so he even overdid me. So I'm very, this is conservative numbers because I didn't want to uh, annoy her all that much. <laughs> Who's not here, okay, great. He's like, you know, I'm not gonna go to that talk because I hate that guy. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and think of this. Um, compilers know what plus, 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 and minus, minus do. Compilers have known for 40 years what plus, plus, and minus, minus do. And when they find them in tandem, when they find them next to each other, they know that uh, they're, you know, they cancel each other. And they often take them away, right? It does, it's not the same for atomics. Atomics must be visible because they're, you know, they're shared effect. And you see a fetch and add, and you see a fetch, uh, a fetch add with plus one and minus one, it's not gonna be the same. it's not gonna look like they cancel each other. And they're not gonna be optimized away. However, Herb, if he were here, he would be bouncing you know, he would up and down like a guy in the Le Cirque du Soleil because he said, no, actually Microsoft Compare does do all that good stuff and et cetera, et cetera. And maybe STL can confirm that or... Great. <laughs> That's the right answer. Okay. So actually Herb kind of, you know, pushed back on that. So keep that in mind. All right. So... <clears throat> Well, how about unwitting sharing? So I want to define a single failure share point because I can't afford a 2.5 to 10 X cost. So therefore I want to define a you know, single threaded share pointer. Um, I, I share, but not across threads kind of thing. So you know, there's uh, what if I do pass it to another thread? And actually there is a solution that which is easy. You just store the thread ID at the first access with, uh, with a smart pointer, and then you assert on it. You assert that the thread ID of the guy, the guy that accesses it is the same as the thread ID that initially created the smart pointer, and you assert on it, and all of that code is just in debug mode, right? And the classic implementation goes, of course, like this. I have like until 4.15? 4.15 is like the, okay, perfect. <clears throat> So I have a single thread pointer, and we go with the absolutely classic uh, structure with two words, two pointers. One is pointing to the payload, and that's P. And the other is pointing to the counter, that's C, and all is good. Okay, so we initialize with null, whatever. We go, well, if we initialize uh, this guy by one, the reference count is one, right? But if the pointer is null, you're going to also initialize this guy as null. And the copying and everything goes as uh, everybody knows this code. It's, it's fairly trivial. Mm, anything interesting here? You just construct. This is the move, move construction. It, uh, it copies the two pointers and resets them right after. And the destructor is going to do the expected things, right? OK. So Herb gave a talk that's available uh, online called Atomic Weapons, and he has a very similar uh, implementation of, uh, uh, atomic, uh, of uh, reference counter pointers, where he uh, has pretty much the code above, except he uses atomic of unsigned star for the counter and uses fetch add and fetch sub for plus plus and minus minus respectively. Very nice. So our task is, you know, we take this naive implementation, no atomics involved we share only within the thread, make it faster, ideas. This is the time where, you know, there's power in numbers, come on. Group like 10, you know, that row, that side, this side, that, do something. Ideas, how to make this faster? Uh, put the count at the, at the head of the... Put the count at the head, oh, make it intrusive. We can't afford, let's say we can't, we don't, we can't afford, it's a good point though, yes. There was a thread local references. Go on. No, you, know, you don't. You want to make me work? No, I want you to work. <laughs> They're like, oh, thread local, run with it. You know? <laughs> so, I don't. I, I don't think I have. A... Okay, something else. Ideas. All right, I have an idea. Um, let's read the paper. <laughs> right. So I read this paper. Uh, down for the count. Um, 
which analyzes reference counting. Down for the count, a nice pun there. And they look at a number of applications uh, and look at how many, you know, how, what's the largest reference count you ever get? And this is the actual number of reference counts, like zero, one, two, three, whatever. And they get to uh, the interesting realization that for like 90% of the application it doesn't get before, uh, above like three. So most objects have very low reference counts. All right, now that we know that, so you know, there's some insight there, which is interesting. Most objects have very low reference count. What's an idea? Yes, in the back. People in the back are always the best. Come again? Steal some of the bits from the object, uh, from the pointer, and put them, you know, count them as the reference count. You know what? I deleted those slides because this is a 90 minutes talk and I, I, read, I compressed it to 60 minutes. So, yes, but there's no slides. It's a good idea. And people do that. You can steal some bits and say, up to 16. What do you do above 16? You saturate, you log, and you leak. Uh, I mean, the program. <laughs> Just to make it right. Saturate, you saturate the counter to 15 or whatever the maximum was. You log the event. You say, you know, here's this, uh, this goddamn object. What the hell, right? <laughs> and, and then you leak it. You let it be. You never de decrement the reference count again. And the application continues to run with the leak and everything. There's, there's a log that witnesses what happened. But the application still behaves normally, still does work, and until you kind of have to reset. Because what the hell? That's like 20 gigabytes of RAM for that application, you know? <laughs> And um, you know this is a fact of life that sometimes you got to do that. It's a great idea. Thanks for uh, uh, stealing my four minutes with this. Although I did have no slide. Other ideas. Great. We're starting to get like really interesting here. Ideas. All right. I have one. <clears throat> yes, Stefan. You could use yeah. You could just make sure. So that that's a sort of applies everywhere and anywhere. Whenever you can, you actually allocate the. Uh, the reference count next to the uh, payload and make the reference count point like one step above, you know, in front of it, and that's all nice because you only do one allocation. So that is great. Whenever you can do it, you should. But what, in, what optimization can you derive from this particular fact that very many objects have very low reference count? Fedor. So we can optimize transition zero to one. You can optimize transition zero to one. And zero, one to zero. Because, okay, okay, I'm getting somewhere. Okay, that beard will never quit. <laughs> All right, so let me show you. For example, so we kind of decrement this guy compulsive, so if the pointer is not null, and we decrement this guy. Why, would, why the heck would you decrement if you know it's one? Huh, okay, let's kind of see if I heard that code. I hope I do. All right, so, oh, let me make a, a few prefatory comments to all that. Because I discovered this in our code base at Facebook. Um, you know, people avoided auto PTR. So it, it's sort of a fact of life that auto PTR didn't work out. So then, back then, in the dark ages, before shared PTR, you were like, oh, well, what do I have? Uh, before unique PTR, people were like, what do I have here? Well, I have uh, TR1 shared PTR, boost shared PTR, as a replacement, right? So they're like, oh, I'm going to use a shared PTR here, although all I need is a one reference, you know, a unique reference kind of pointer, because I don't have the unique PTR thing. So I'm going to use this guy, even though I know the count is going to be always one and zero. I mean, one and then going away, right? Interesting. And I did notice that there are designs that just put shared PTR there for future flexibility. Like, well, there is one uh, owner right now, but what if in the future, you know, when the, that hoverboard, where's the hoverboard in the future? <laughs> Back to the future. Okay, so, you know, for the future, I just put uh, that flexibility in there. Rightly or wrong, it could be right reasons, there could be wrong reasons. It's not my place to, uh, to discuss that, right? So, okay, interesting. So let's change the code to do, first of all, lazy reference count allocation. We're gonna get to uh, Fedor's uh, idea in a minute. Uh, but let's do this. Actually, let's make this. Whenever a counter is null, it means it's really one. Huh, so I get unique pointer for free. Does your share, where's your share pointer? Does your share pointer do that? Uh, it cannot. This is not applicable to the script share pointer. Very well. 
Why? Uh huh. Weak pointers, right? Right. But every machine has double the uh, double wide locking. All right. Let the record state that he said it's not impossible. <laughs> <and that. laughs> okay. Anywho, so we're not worrying about weak pointers here. But we are worrying about uh, optimizing this particular single thread pointer. So let's do this. Well, whenever I, whenever I start with a pointer, I say, well, I'm, uh, for example, I'm, construct I'm copying a pointer. And if the counter is not, I'm allocating with two. Nice, because it's already two. Because one means really null, right? And uh, otherwise, I'm just going to increment it. And there's a subtlety here, uh, which goes, ah, how about this guy? Why do you think I commented that out and wrote unneeded? Keep in mind, I'm famous for having mistakes in my slides, so that may be a mistake. But it may not be. Why do you think I afforded that? And that's an extra, that's a less of a write, which is a big deal, actually, at scale. Right? It's an, a story. It's a, why, why is that? Exactly. You, you have this invariant that says, well, if the, if the payload is null, you don't even look at the counter. So it can be anything. You can leave it actually dangle, which is dangerous, but fun, right? <laughs> nice. So far, so good. And then I have the destructor, which does exactly what I promised. If the pointer is not null, I'm not looking at anything else. First line, awesome. And then I have the fa my famous go to Susumi, so you know, and stuff like that. It makes the code smaller, my friends. I'm not kidding. Try to do this without the go to, and uh, you know, it's not gonna. It's difficult. So it goes back and deletes uh, this guy and whatever, and that kind of stuff. Pretty nice. I'm not. I'm not above using go to, if it has a an advantage, right? Very nice. <clears throat> so there's an alternative to this. Well, now you need the C. And in this case, you look at, uh, you know, you look at the, the reference counter first, and then you, uh, then you delete both, right? And that's interesting because it folds the test for null into the delete call. As I'm sure you know, if you call delete against the null pointer, it's guaranteed to do nothing. So essentially, it has already a test for nullness inside of it. And this uh, variant exploits that. But now there's a story to that, because if you do an if uh, and, uh, you know, before the delete, then the code is going to be smaller because maybe you don't call delete. So the call to delete is kind of remote. And um, you pay the cost of the call, and the test is done inside of delete, which may be an out-of-line function. And so you pay the, uh, the price for the call even though the point is zero. So if the point is almost always zero, then you may want to actually uh, not take, uh, not take this path. All right, so the performance dynamics goes like this. If I have one reference, that means the pointer is not null, and the counter is null, or the counter is one. And that means unique reference. How can the counter be ever one? Because remember, I initialized it to two. Decurrence. So when I go back, I don't compulsively say, oh, did you get down to two? Then let me kind of, uh, from two to one, then let me uh, you know, delete it and nullify it. Why don't I do that? No. Right, so I don't have to thrash. I don't say, oh, delete, then allocate again. Once you allocate some memory, it's good to kind of hold on to it a bit, right? You pay the cost for it, so you better make some good use of it. You get your money's worth, right? Exactly, thank you. So once you allocate, then you, know, you allocate the thing, you initialize that too, but when it goes down from two to one, you don't say, let me just delete this guy because I don't need it. Let me hold on to it, okay? Nice. Um, uh, this is what I just said, and go to, awesome, everything. Constructors get smaller and use zero initialization because I initialize uh, with, uh, with the null pointers and everything. And I can control the number of copies better than the number of creations. And this is an interesting insight. The number of creations very often is like, you know, I need these objects, so I'm gonna, but I can control copies by passing by reference, teasing the, the raw pointer out of the smart pointer. So I have some control over how many copies of the shared pointer I'm making. 
but I don't have much con as much control over the, how many uh, copies I'm, cr I'm creating, right? Uh, how many uh, creations, how many objects I'm creating. So uh, that's sort of a nice thing because it indicates that uh, certain functions here are hotter than others. So this is not as hot as, for example, this, because this is uh, it's gonna be deleted as many times as it's created. So nice. All right. Uh, and tip three, which we, we get to Fedor's uh, famous beard, um, which is, well, skip the last decrement. When you get there, you're there, so don't decrement that guy because you're doing a write extra and the write is expensive. The worst thing in computing are indirect writes. I hate them, right? So indirect writes, the, the anathema, you never want to write indirectly. Just do everything in registers, okay? They do it, yeah. Four kilobytes to the man on the moon, right? Four kilobytes, and right now there's, that's like the L0 cache, right? It's a, the register file. Yeah, sure, four kilobytes. All right, I was kidding here, so you can use memory, but just don't overuse it, okay? <laughs> so skip the last decrement. Uh, in the destructor here, we're gonna build, instead of saying if uh, minus minus C equals zero, we say, well, let's just, just look at that guy and see if it's one. If it's one, then I know I'm done, so I don't uh, touch it anymore. Big deal. I don't touch it anymore, big deal. So I'm going to do the, the whole thing. Skip the last decrement. Any more ideas? Okay, let's optimize this even more, yes. You can cache the read of C, of star C, right? Let's see. Uh, if not C, that's loading the pointer. And star, okay. Uh, right. The compiler is gonna do it. But you know, it's, it's a sort of a good point. You want to disassemble this code and look at it, literally. You want to look at this code and say, well, was this uh, loaded into a register and kept it kept around until this decrement, right? It's a good point. You know, this is a, a sort of micro-optimization, but you know, how about a, something more interesting? Yes? Could you shift all the counts down by one so that you can make your comparison against zero instead of one? Why do I want to make a comparison against zero, my because fair friend? Aha, uh -huh. yes, <laughs> all right, I'm starting to blow myself here. Yes, you want zeros, why do you want zero? No, I, yes, I mean no, I mean sometimes. The instructions are gonna be smaller. So we, did we just talk about that? Let, let me kind of skip ahead a bit. Right, I'm gonna go back in the, because we got into this, what, what's wrong with you? Okay, so zero is special. Special assignment, so I mentioned this already, so I'm just going to, going to kind of uh, uh, punt a bit on it. But essentially, zero is special. There's a lot of places where zero is produced, and you know, uh, for example, on a risk machine, how do you produce a zero? XOR. You XOR a register with itself, right? And it's gonna, gonna, just gonna be zero. So, uh, and how do you load this? Uh, so how, that's how you load this. How do you compare against zero? Okay. You have a test, it's already there, so you don't need to compare it. If you, how do you compare it against one? Oh wait, I have a constant in instruction stream, that I cache is expensive. So I don't want to load the constant in instruction stream, which is one, and kind of load it and look at it and compare and all that stuff, right? That's hard work. I just want to say test and be done with it. Um, so it's very special, it's very nice. And in Anini, we want to make zero the most frequent value. Um, let me see if I have this link here. Yeah, I have this link. You know what, I'm gonna, gonna take a risk here and load this link. Uh, but before that, let me explain what I mean. So I'm gonna load this link and see if the, the whole infrastructure works here. So a weird sub-tip sub would be, well, make default state all zeros because zeros are nice, and I want the default state of my objects to be all zeros because then the compiler detects that, and it's gonna, ah, oh, this is a zero, I can use a special mem set or a special loads or whatever. And to wit, I have this example for you. Oh God, make it work. Oh, okay, allow I guess. <laughs> All right, uh, okay, this doesn't look good. Okay, hmm, Does anyone, can anyone see any of this? Probably not, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, good, great. So, okay, that doesn't help much. All right, so I have uh, struct point zero here. Uh, let me highlight the code that I'm uh, kind of pointing at. 
I have struct uh, point zero, which initializes very naively. It says point zero, the default constructor initializes x by, x by zero, y by zero, and z by zero. Very nice. And the actual routine that uses point zero is going to look like this. Bam. Took source return because it returns a the fun returns a point. Let me show you the, the function. This returns a default constructed point, right? And the content of the function is like three instructions. Took source, two XORs, and the red. Very small. And then I have a point, thank you. And then I have a point one, which says, well, let me initialize them to minus one because I'm a bad guy. And I want, you know, and I want to initialize them by minus one. And then I'm writing a routine that's going to gun, be called gun and return point one. And gun looks completely different and a lot larger. In reality, it looks only one instruction larger. It, actually, it's a lot larger because those XOR instructions are one byte or one word, I forgot. Um, but these moves are, you know, contain like the minus one, which is a word by itself, and then the instruction itself and all that bad stuff, right? So completely different code generated. I'm glad this, uh, this worked. All right. So to kind of uh, conclude on this particular zero thing, uh, I think I mentioned this in my previous talk that, uh, uh, that uh, I gave at, uh, uh, at Microsoft. Um, by mistake, I've, I found it more natural to swap these two values of an enum, and I got a 0.5% regression <laughs> because everybody was testing against foo. Uh, if this equals foo and this is not, that is foo. If that is different from foo. And all, everybody was testing on foo, not on bar. And when I swapped them, foo became one. And everybody was testing against one. And guess what? Guess what, where the code that was testing was? Where was it? Everywhere. In a destructor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. All right, let me turn back now and kind of continue with the show here. Uh, okay, where were we? Azure special, back, back, back. All right, so it's keeping the last decrement. So that's a great, that's a great thing. Awesome. Um, so you know, we're again motivated by the fact that most objects have low reference counts. So out of how many, you know, how many increments I'm doing on a given counter, it's going to be the last one is going to be maybe half of all increments, right? Because I only have like two copy, two references to that guy. So it's actually fr fractionally speaking, the last decrement is huge, right? Oh, I just said that. Um, and one other interesting thing, which uh, comes uh, kind of, uh, it's subtle. Uh, I was uh, speaking to uh, uh, Jason Evans, the, the author of J. Malloc, and he said, one of the worst mistakes that people who implement malloc and free do is to keep the metadata with the data. I see a nod from Nevin. Why is the metadata doing that bad? It's on the same cache line, and the thing is, when you free, very often you free cold memory. When you call free, like delete, right? When you free stuff, you free very often it's cold memory. And if you need to write to the metadata, you need to write to the metadata to mark it as free. And at the, that moment, you are going to write to cold memory. So you're loading that memory, write to it, it's free. And then it's, it, you dirty the thing. So it's it kind of the worst thing ever, right? So you dirty the, the damn page there, and then you never use it, use it again. And the CPU has no idea that you don't plan to use it again, right? It's completely weird. So a good, a good allocator keeps the metadata separated from the actual payloads, such that on free memory it just touches only the metadata, which is, of course, always hot. Fedor, destroy me. Right. Right. So the, the point was, well, uh, if you have a, a good mallocator, you're going to use free lists, which are going to take care of that because they're going to reuse that, that cold memory over again. Um, well, do you like fragmentation? No, the idea was you would say no, and I would say then don't use free lists. <laughs> that, that's the way the sketch goes here. <laughs> Right. No. So, of course. So there's there's uh, there's qualifications and qualifications and qualifications to everything, right? But as a first level of approximation, essentially, this is an issue with uh, with freeing at, uh, uh, blocks of memory and 
Um, let's leave it at that for now. And kind of, you can destroy me offline, just not in front of everybody, okay? <laughs> All right, so avoid that. This is the argument that I just made. And um, uh, well, you know, as I said, we want to replace interlock decrement with an atomic read in the variant that would be actually thread shared and not only uh, shared the, in, it's not a thread, the same thread. So actually the impact of this optimization in particular is huge for shared PTR STD, you know, the guy that does the, the interlock decrement. Just do an atomic read and by the way, on x86 that's free because all, all reads are atomic, right? Thank you. Yes, destroy me, oh my God. Okay, whenever he raises the hand, okay. Okay, because of that, that weak point, it really kind of, right, doesn't he grind your gears, huh? Okay, great. So, um, we talked about this, right, okay, we discussed this guy. All right, um, I have two smaller tips. It turns out that uh, using dedicated allocators, it, it's just a fact of life that many large applications uh, inevitably migrate to like, you know, using their own allocation scheme. General purpose allocators are just not gonna cut the mustard. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna work most of the time for most applications, etc. It's just that for high performance applications, there's always going to be something you can do that malloc doesn't do, right? And um, allocate, uh, dedicated allocators do a lot of good stuff, uh, such as, for example, there's uh, heaps that store one control bit per counter and store metadata packed together, and it's always hot. So I have a very low overhead for small objects. Uh, in these cases, we allocate these small units all over the place. So we want to allocate them really fast, right? And uh, a, really small, um, a really small block allocator can do wonders there. So you can have a very low overhead for a 32-bit counter there. And um, of course, the metadata is very cache friendly. And you can use free list that we just talked about uh, as an alternative. You gotta have each, the disadvantage is each counter has to be a one word because it's gotta store a pointer in it. So it's, you know, you gotta measure and uh, think of it and really uh, be careful about it, right? And uh, the last tip, which, which is, uh, I mentioned it already a bit, uh, is odd. Actually, I have people like really raising protests here, like what the hell are you talking about? So the vast majority of objects, as we talked, have less than 16 references. And you can prefer a smaller counter if you can pack it together with something else. And on saturate, you leak, you log, and everything goes forward, right? This blows up the code size. What does it blow up the code size? The oh, the logging. Okay, awesome. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> All right. So to summarize, uh, there's a dictum that uh, we hear very often in the C++ community, which is you're not that special. Many people used to say, well. You know, I know the, what um, the coding standards say and whatever, but I'm special and therefore I'm entitled to do all sorts of things. Whatever, you know, whatever the scene was, there was a rationalization for it because you are special, right? And you know, th there's been like a push from the pundits in the C++ community to say, well, actually you're not that special. And actually I remember Scott Myers who had this, like you're not that special and think, uh, you know, think of your case as a t more of a typical case than the atypical case. I would say nowadays, there's, you know, the brass knuckles are, are on. Like, whenever you use, whenever you use systems programming in a large application, there's gonna be huge pressure for you to deliver on performance. Because otherwise, they do it in Ruby. Uh, code. <laughs> did, I, did I annoy, did I offend it? Okay, uh, Mike, delete that, okay? So the post-processing is there. So, now here's the thing. <laughs> code, I heard that this last night. Ruby is 50 times slower than anything else. Which is kind of contradictory when you think of it because it can be you know, 50 times slower than something that's already like 10 times slower. But it's 50 times slower than anything, which is interesting. <laughs> and uh, Ruby and uh, you know, uh, higher level languages are a good fit for certain applications. 
But definitely, at, by the point you care about this kind of stuff that we just discussed, you can assume you're special. You can assume you're special. You can assume that whatever is standard and uh, given to you and recommended to most of us is not enough. And you gotta kind of get there and kind of really reach for, reach for the, the last ounce of performance and get it, you know, scrape, like squeeze that, squeeze that stone, okay? Until blood comes out of it, all right? Thanks very much. I wanted, to, I wanted to finish high with applause on a nice sentence there, but I have five minutes for questions. <laughs> so, there's any. Oh, okay, don't. <laughs> this is not questions. Ah, Stefan, awesome, um, yes. For single-threaded smart pointers, I have heard of linked smart pointers, which the standard says, oh yeah, you can use this, but nobody does for Stitcher Pointer because it's multi-threaded. For single-threaded, does that help? Link smart pointers. So instead of storing an explicit count, you kind of link right. them together. Yeah. Some doubly linked list and chain right. together all the things, and that's your uh, count. Is that? The doubly linked list is too much of a blow up in size, and the singly linked list is all van deletion. So it's between a stone and a hard place. It's not that, you know, it's not that good actually. Excellent. I will file an issue to make the standard say that use count is efficient. All right. I guess you can code this recording <laughs> as evidence. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, so we've uh, spent some time doing micro-optimizations to reduce like, to use zero instead of one in comparisons. Does it really make sense when, anyway, we're still doing allocations and deallocations, does it uh, give us anything or is it just academic? Uh, an allocation, so, uh, okay, so I assume the question has been heard. Uh, allocations uh, take you about 150 cycles to get you there. So one allocation takes like, you know, general purpose memory allocator, it's gonna take, you know, it's, it's gonna use all, all of these good techniques. Every, after all is told, there's gonna be 100, 150 cycles that are gonna, um, with that, you're not gonna be able to measure any difference by the zero there. Thanks. Questions? Questions? Oh, by the way, so to kind of to continue on that, there's always, after this talk, there's always somebody who comes, actually I tested that and I had the one and replaced it with a zero and I, I saw no difference whatsoever. Well, you know, caveat emptor, it's not always gonna, these are not gonna do miracles for you every time, right? Yes? So some of those things we did, such as choose zero, they're pretty specific to the end of architecture, how they're continuing to improve their not trying to do that. So the question was, uh, some of the stuff is specific to Intel, and uh, how does that, this advice pour to other architectures? I would say maybe, uh, actually zeros are, uh, you know, are pretty un universally special to CPUs. Um, and in general, like these tips, in my opinion, port pretty well across uh, modern architectures. So you, you can be safe that uh, they're gonna help. Yes. All right, so let's take the break and um, I'll be here for a few more minutes. Thank you very much.